when I was thinking about my talk this year, uh, it was at a time when I had just left law enforcement after 31 years uh, doing things a certain way, uh, a certain number of times over and over again, and I crawled out of my law enforcement bubble and looked at the universe around me and realized that there was some really different things out there outside law enforcement. Now, I had always known this. This wasn't a surprise. But from the perspective of law enforcement, I always thought, we've got all these rules we need to operate under. Sometimes we've got advantages with those rules. But all those folks on the private sector side, they have so many more possibilities than we have. Uh, and so once I was out of that law enforcement bubble, I looked around and I said, holy cow, nothing is like I thought it was going to be. Um, so this is me. Um, I am the president of Gilbert Digital Forensics. It's been two years already. It doesn't feel like it's even been a year. Um, I'm really enjoying the private sector a whole lot and still am working a lot with law enforcement, but, um, but am branching out into civil cases and, and uh, different opportunities. So I was a cop for 31 years. Um, I can't say that I truly miss it. I miss the people. I don't particularly miss the work. Um, <laughs> but I'm also very willing to help law enforcement with their work if, if, it, uh, if it is needed. So um, anyway, I also um, got my master's degree at University College in Dublin, which um, if there are any other graduates out there, we should get together at a break and compare notes. Um, great program out there. And finally, um, one of my biggest influence in forensics has been working with Heather and Lee to co-author and teach the 585 Advanced Smartphone Forensics course. I started this back in my law enforcement days and have continued to work on that course um, and have loved work with have, working with Heather and Lee um, because we're always doing new things. Uh, I think throughout this conference, we've heard about the pace of change, the number of artifacts, new different artifacts, not knowing how to fully parse something, not knowing what an artifact means. Uh, when you're knee deep in the cell phone forensics world, that is your everyday uh, life. So you have to learn really quickly um, to work things out or to figure out what you can figure out and save in your memory banks what you haven't figured out yet for the future, because at some point we come across solutions. So I want to talk to you today about uh, what I'm going to call ground truth, right? That the, the ideas, the assumptions, the knowledge we all start from, um, what we see through empirical observation in our daily jobs, uh, what we consider to be the fundamental truth, the way things are, and how that can kind of get in our way in forensics and incident response of, um, of seeing what things, how things really are, uh, because sometimes those assumptions come at us and uh, we believe them more than we believe what we're actually seeing um, in our labs. So I'm going to talk about a few things. I want to start with an oldie but a goodie, um, imaging. And then I want to talk about firmware and hardware because we largely ignore those things um, until recently, right? Um, there's been a little kerfuffle about firmware. Um, and it's died down a little bit, but the problem is still fundamentally there. Um, and I want to talk about hardware, because we make a lot of assumptions about hardware that aren't necessarily true. And then I want to talk about, hey, you know, for 31 years I was testifying in court, 17 of those doing forensics, I was like, I swear that I'm telling you the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. And then I find out later I was wrong, right? What do we do about it? And how do we keep moving forward if we get stuck to these assumptions that kind of hold our, uh, our field back in some ways. Um, how do we correct those truths, and how do we make sure that it's not affecting you know, somebody's, uh, somebody's livelihood through the civil side or someone's um, lifetime through the criminal side? So Oscar Wilde, a hero of mine, once said, the, the pure and simple truth is rarely pure and never simple. Um, I think that could be an alternate title to my talk. Um, Jared, where are you? I don't know if Jared's in the room anymore, but he should recognize this picture. Um, this is giant Jenga from a couple of years ago. Um, he and I 
uh, had an ongoing, I guess, uh, competition. This is the perfect game of Jenga, if you'll notice, right? There, you can't do anything more than that. Uh, notice how the base is steady. At the top, we start to tumble a little bit, right? Um, this is a great analogy, because when you're doing um, forensics on the cutting edge, when you're doing new things, new research, testing um, the boundaries of what we already know and trying to discover new things, you often find yourself there at the top of the pile, trying to balance and not slide off, okay? Um, I'm glad we captured this image because uh, it was a great moment in time and a really good analogy. So imaging, um, how many people in the, in the room are still under the belief that when you hook a hard drive, let's go with a, a traditional spinning hard drive up to a right blocker, and you image that with forensic software that you're getting every bit of data from the first to the last, and that's the full physical image that you're working with. How many people have ever written that in a report? I have, come on, be proud. It's, it's good, it's what we were all taught. National White Collar Crime Center, uh, doesn't matter where you were taught it, right? They said, when you hook this up to this device, it prevents data from getting written back to the drive. Your software can address first bit to last bit, you're getting every piece of data, and you now have a full image to work with, and that's forensically sound, okay? So in 2012, um, and, and we end up with this nice, this is, you know, FTK Imager on one of the SANS images. We get this nice report that says, yes, our hash values match, everything is cool. Um, so for years, we've operated under the assumption that we're getting everything there is to get, right? Like there's nothing else beyond that, and if it doesn't exist in that, it's not part of our image. Problem is, is that that's not true. Um, and in 2012, um, we had um, a bunch of people come out and say, hey, you know, what about all of the, the system service areas? What about the areas of the hard drive that our own right blockers are telling us hey, there's six power cycles there, there's seven starts and stops, here's the serial number for the drive. Like if I did a, a search across that physical image, would I come up with that serial number? What if I didn't? Where's the, where is the right blocker getting that from? Right, like if that's not in my physical image. Um, so at the bottom is a reference there, but there's, you know, from 2012, we've known this. And the thing is, we've moved forward through time, just kind of going, la, 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 la. <laughs> um, and when I came into the data recovery world, um, I realized that data recovery really looks deeply at these service areas, the, the smart area and the reserved area and all of that servo information and looking for hey, where, where has this data been? How was it arranged? What blocks are good? What blocks are bad? Is there something that we can do to look at those other areas and grab that data back? Um, and then we've got the host protected area. We've got DCO. Our, our tools now account for all of that. And we've got this question of firmware. Where does that live, right? Like, where does that live in our systems? And are we addressing it or even considering it in our exams? Um, so these, these screenshots are actually from an actual case. Employee data theft, guy turns in his computer, no data left on the device. Um, we go to image the hard drive and we're like, wait, what hard drive from a, from a person who's worked for a company for 10 years has only been cycled six or seven times, right? This is the old switcheroo. Like we could do whatever we wanted on this drive, but it was brand new, out of the box. Um, swapped with the hard drive that had the information on it that the, that the guy didn't want to turn in. Um, and, and we're never going to find data on this drive because it never existed here, okay? He had sworn in court that he had turned in everything, um, so he had some explaining to do uh, in this particular case. But if we don't look at this, we're never going to see that simple answer, right? Like his actual hard drive had about 27,000 starts and stops, and that makes a whole lot more sense um, as far as simple answers are concerned. Um, so another set of firmware, of myths, um, is, is about firmware. Um, I will admit to you that I have thought very little about firmware in my career, okay? Very, very little. 
Um, and in the last two years, I've thought about firmware a whole lot because it matters. I used to think, hey, as long as it's, it, it's not um, malfunctioning, as long as that phone isn't in a boot loop, um, if it's working, what does it matter? Um, in reality, it really matters, right? Like Intel's now finding this out. Um, and the second part of this becomes, well, hey, if we as the forensics community aren't thinking about firmware, maybe it really doesn't matter because it's so esoteric and so weird that nobody really is gonna mess with the firmware. Well, firmware is everywhere, right? Like if you've ever had a cable box in the 80s and flashed that cable box so that you could get those channels illegally, you were messing with the firmware. And farmers, American farmers, are messing with the firmware in their tractors. They're reflashing their tractors in order to repair their tractors on their own or to go to a third party to repair the tractors, um, both out of convenience and out of cost. Um, so farmers are doing it. We do it with our cable boxes. We do it with our phones if we're flashing our phones or rooting our phones. Um, it's not particularly hard to do. It doesn't take a lot of technical knowledge. There's a lot of instructions out there. Um, a, another great example of this is USB drives. Um, one major source of business for the data recovery side of Gilware is a number of USB drives that are always sent in to us. The customer says, I bought this 128 gigabyte um, drive hard drive, it's a USB drive on Amazon. I got it for 18 bucks. I put like 18 gigabytes of pictures on it and I don't know where they all went. Well, someone has reflashed the firmware, um, counterfeited that, hard, that, that thumb drive to make it appear to be larger than it is um, and their files were too big to fit on that drive and never made it to the drive, okay? So this is something that I saw once in my law enforcement career, but I see over and over again coming through the data recovery company. We've got someone laughing, maybe you have <laughs> had this experience. Um, but it is very common. We have tons and tons of counterfeited USB devices out there being sold for cheap on Amazon or wherever else. Um, and USB, uh, sorry, firmware-based uh, based systems are everywhere. Any embedded system is going to have firmware. Um, keyboards, webcams, sound cards, cell phones, um, audio recorders, smart TVs, digital cameras, all of these things operate um, based on the firmware. So if we can hack that firmware, change that firmware, we can change what that thing thinks it is or what it thinks it's supposed to do or we can make data we can make areas for data to be stored that wouldn't necessarily be there. Or we can do some other things like, uh, let's see, from a forensic standpoint, we look at USB store in the registry to see unique serial numbers for devices, right? USB devices. What if I could make 50 USB drives that all had the same unique serial number? Would that pose some problems from a forensic standpoint? Okay, there might be ways around this. Everybody's thinking, okay, how would I recognize that? This is good. This is what I'm trying to get you to think about because these possibilities are out there and we're actively seeing them in case work um, and the potential for them. So firmware matters. Um, firmware can be easily exploited. Anybody ever work on a firmware exploitation case? Anybody work in any cases involving Intel? chipsets and, and messing with that firmware. You're not gonna say you are if you are probably, but, uh, but it is an issue out there. Um, firmware is easily exploited. It's not protected very well. It's not meant for security. Um, we can think about Meltdown Inspector. We can think about the AMT firmware vulnerability, um, active management technology. If we open up the, the firmware, uh, box here, we can, we can change all sorts of things about that device, even if the device is off, right? Which is why this is, this is kind of a, a, a scary new territory that we're walking into. Um, but from another standpoint, firmware is really helpful. If we're able to write custom firmware uh, for flash memory, we can do some things to access and deal with data that otherwise we might not be able to access and deal with in phones. 
if we have that phone that's stuck in a boot loop, if we have that phone that we can't get to turn on, sometimes custom firmware um, is the answer. And by the way, our forensic um, tools are doing this in order to give us access to some of, uh, of the phones. So those, those custom firmware solutions are out there. Um, and so it can help us. It can also cause some scary things. But we certainly shouldn't be you know, sitting there with our blinders on in the forensics world deciding that firmware doesn't matter, especially because if farmers can flash the firmware on their tractors, really anybody can flash their firmware on anything. Um, and there are lots of exploits out there. Um, another set of myths has to do with hardware. Um, and my mind was, hey, as long as the hardware works, that's cool. We're going to get what we need. Um, in reality, the hardware can matter. Again, with phones, sometimes we're able to do um, some things with hardware to short out things in order to gain access to phones that otherwise we can't get access to. Um, so that's a direct hardware exploit. Um, and again, with hardware, USB drives, um, we can make the assumption that under the covers, if we buy a whole lot of the same kind of USB drive, they're going to be exactly the same. Um, right? So this is leftovers from, from yesterday, but we have you know, six identical looking thumb drives on the outside. We assume that the hardware in here is the same. Um, I'm here to tell you that the hardware that gets used in these is not high quality. Right? It can be factory seconds. It can be um, just you know, the extras at the end of a run. Uh, we recently, I don't have a picture in my, in my slides, but we recently came across two PNY thumb drives that have the same chip as the iPhone 6 in them, and it was just glued right to the board. Um, and when the guys in the lab saw that, they brought the PNY drives back to me, and they were like, hey, Cindy, look at this. Isn't this cool? And I'm like, that's very cool. Right? Because from that standpoint, that same chip has been used in a, a different application. But might that be an in for us from a research point of view into some of the mysteries of that, that chip that gets used in the iPhone 6? Okay? Um, we haven't figured out quite what we're going to do with that yet, but it does open up that new possibility. Again, you find yourself at the end, at the very top of that Jenga tower going, OK, what do I do now? Right? Like, what do I do with this now that I see that the possibilities exist here? Um, so hardware really does matter. If I'm starting uh, from right to left here, you can see two phone boards. One of them looks really bad, right? Really bad. The other one is identical, but it hasn't been burned with a body in a burn barrel. Okay? So Chicago Police Department came to us. They had a guy who was killed and burned in a barrel with his phone. His phone was basically a hockey puck. Um, we took the chip off the burned board. We put the chip back on the not burned board. Hardware matters, right? Um, and we were able to get the data out of that. We also got the data out of the micro SD card. Um, in the middle there, we have a hardware solution for getting data out of uh, an SD card. Um, in this case, we're using those, those taps and soldering to them in order to put them onto an adapter and read directly from the flash memory. Um, and, and on the, uh, the, the far left, what you're seeing is our first attempts at doing um, chip replacement on, uh, on a healthy smartphone, so board to board chip replacement um, in order to get data out of a locked phone. Um, and that was successful for us. So it's something that we're starting to do more is to say, hey, if we may need to replace one chip, we may need to replace two or three or four, but sometimes the solution to getting into these phones isn't through the software or the firmware, but in actually doing uh, what we call Franken phones and, and replacing the hardware um, onto new phones. So that, that work was done with, by Mark, Mike Scar on, on the end there, and uh, Greg Andrzejewski and Mike worked um, on the other two phones. But some really cool and new solutions um, to issues. So 
one of the things I really loved about um, Yaleware when I first walked into it is they have this room they call the hardware, or sorry, the hard drive library. You're seeing a single row. Um, this is a room that has about 10 of these sets of shelves with every make and model of hard drive right down to the old Bigfoot. Do you remember those old Bigfoot drives? There's some Bernoullis in there, there's some really old stuff, and there's some new stuff. Um, and what they've done is come up with this collection of old hard drives. And at first I didn't quite understand. Like, what are you doing with this, your hoarders, right? I'm gonna come into this hoarding company. Um, but I quickly came to understand that, hey, if you have a library of drives at your disposal, if you need to swap out heads or swap a board or do whatever, then all you gotta do is go to the library and check out the, the, right, um, the right piece of equipment to do that work. Um, so it becomes really, really convenient. So sometimes a simple repair, a reconfiguration, um, can solve a problem that other methods won't solve. Um, and doing those board swaps uh, and chip swaps and head swaps can get us into data that we wouldn't be able to get into before. Um, and then there are alternative input methods. Okay, I'm, I'm showing you over there on the left. I know it's kind of an ugly picture. I snapped it with my iPhone as we were doing this. Um, that is a broken iPad. You can see the home button is messed up. Um, and we were doing a data recovery job here. Um, we were able to bypass the passcode, not using the keyboard um, methods that some people are using to, to emulate a keyboard, but using some other accessibility options okay, that, that I'm not going to fully disclose. But needless to say, it's a hardware hack, right? You can see that we're doing something to that hardware to bypass that, and we're using some of those accessibility options. So we couldn't do this without having the hardware, and we couldn't do this with the encrypted version of the data on that chip. We have to think about these embedded systems as a whole system. So Yes, the data on the drive or, or the chip matters. Yes, the firmware matters, and yes, the hardware matters. And in combination, all three of those things, if we're able to work on that original device or if we're able to, um, to, to come up with a clone device of some sort, uh, we can make some of these, these issues work. Um, so this middle picture um, looks weird, doesn't it? Any guesses as to what we've done there? So this is a phone. The only problem with it was that we couldn't get it turned on. It had been in, in, involved in a traffic accident. We were trying to get the data out for a law enforcement agency. Um, they knew the passcode, but it wouldn't turn on. Um, and it's an iPhone. Uh, what you're seeing there is just some freeze spray. So you can get this uh, kind of ice in a can. Um, and we've sprayed down the board um, and then turned on the device. And you can see the melted spots. Those are the components that are bad. Okay, those are the ones that are shorting out and causing the problem. Replace those components, that phone will work. Okay? So um, what this caused me to do, and every time I come to a conference, I have the same problem, right? You learn new stuff, and you're like, I got to go back and work the last 10 cases I worked because I missed. Um, and what this caused me to do was to say to myself, you know, those hundreds of devices that came through my lab in law enforcement where you plug it in, you look at it, you say, nothing here, I'm gonna chuck that away, or this one doesn't work, okay, move on to the next one. Um, there's just so many things that are possibilities that I could go back and try. Um, but now I know they're possibilities and I can move forward. What we need are people who are thinking about these possibilities and moving it forward. Um, so here's a great example. This is actually the example of someone breaking my ground truth that got me to leave law enforcement a year early. So I left at 49. I could have retired with my pension at 50. I wasn't going to retire. No, no danger of that. But um, when I walked through the lab, um, they were working on a data recovery case for a photographer. She had done a wedding um, in a foreign country. And she had accidentally, after the wedding, reformatted her SD card. It was for a celebrity, so she really needed those pictures back. They weren't going to go back and restage the wedding. 
and she had already accepted a retainer, which was um, already used um, in the travel. So she was really in a, a stuck position. So if you were to look at this SD card using forensics tools, this is what you'd see in a hex editor, all zeros, okay? You guys have been doing forensics for a while. When you see all zeros, data's gone, right? You're kind of screwed. It means it's wiped or you know, you're, not, you're not going to be able to get data back from it. Sorry about that, Viv, I saw you laughing. It's 30 years of law enforcement. I'm gonna swear once in a while. <laughs> um, so anyway, for the most part, in law enforcement, I would have been done with this exam, right? It, another kind of pictures case that could have come in in a child pornography case. I would have looked at this SD card and moved on to the next piece of evidence. I would have been missing lots of data. Uh, they were able to recover 300 plus images off this SD card, and I would have, in law enforcement, left all of those behind, okay? We're not gonna be able to do that with NCASE. We're not gonna be able to do that with FTK. You have to have um, other tools to, to get underneath. And in this case, in this really super simplistic overview um, about why you shouldn't believe the card is empty, um, our file-based, our, our software-based um, forensic software um, understands things at only the top level. Uh, it can read that file system data and it can report it back to you. But with flash memory, we also have the flash translation layer, um, which shows through the controller how the device should appear to the user. If you reformat it, it should appear to you to be empty, correct, and ready to be read by other, uh, by other tools. Um, and underneath all that, until garbage collection and wear leveling happens, all that data is there, it's just the controller has told the card to report itself as empty, okay? So if we just ignore what our forensic tools tell us and get a physical image of this card, um, usually through a chip off or a direct read of that NAND memory, um, and then rebuild that, uh, we can start to see that there's data still there. Um, and so with flash memory devices, there's usually two avenues to, to data extraction, either um, through that normal device interface or through direct read of the NAND. If we're reading it through the normal device interface, um, whether we're talking about an SD card or, an S, or, a, or a solid state drive, um, we have to power on that device, right? If we power on that device, what we're doing is kicking in the possibility of wear leveling and garbage collection happening, and we could be potentially destroying things underneath on the flash memory itself, okay? So I'm not saying, everybody, stop what you're doing. Stop imaging those drives. Um, what I'm saying to you is that this potential exists. And so in a case where you have a thumb drive, um, and you need to know what's in that flash memory, and you really, really need to know what used to be there too, um, plugging it in is probably a bad idea. You should be chipping that sucker off first as your first response. Um, luckily, thumb drives are easy to put back together. The soldering job is not very hard at all. Um, but if you don't take that opportunity and you plug it in and um, electricity is applied and wear leveling and garbage collection happens, then you're not going to have the possibility to, do, to, um, to get back any things that, that might have been on there. So in this case, if we look below that flash translation layer at the physical memory itself, we can see that data is still there. Okay, I'm, I'm showing you a, a picture of a screen of a tool that's working. Um, this is Rusalut by, um, by a Russian company, so it, it might preclude its use by some people in the room, but it is a fantastic tool set. So when we read that, trip, that chip directly um, and read the NAND, uh, we can see that there's data still there. This is a significant puzzle, right, because every one of those controllers for every one of those chips has its own recipe for how to put back that memory, how to put it back together. 
And at that level, um, when we're looking at the substrate of the chip itself and have pulled back the data from it, um, there are also errors in the surface of the chip, and the controller accounts for them, right? So, um, so there are possibilities that this can be put back together wrong or not quite right, or that it can look exactly right but be put together two different ways, right? Because what we want is that logical level above. So all I'm saying to you is there are definitely possibilities out there that are beyond what we know to be um, the ground truth. I'm also saying to you that at this point in time anyway, it's not practical to do this with every case or with every device. Um, individual NAND flash memory chips um, use um, standard, uh, use industry standard interfaces. Um, we can read that hardware. Uh, we can pull it into our tools and then work with it, and it seems really straightforward, but it's difficult um, to make use of that raw data. And it's sometimes difficult to figure out what recipe has been applied to that data and to bring it back into a way that makes sense to us. Um, a lot of this is proprietary, and we're waiting on other people to reverse engineer it, right? Or we've got people in our labs who are working on reverse engineering it. Um, but it's one of those things where the technology hasn't quite caught up with our industry yet. Um, and, oh, by the way, this can be physically destructive to your original device, which um, people sometimes have a lot of heartache with, which I totally get, right? What do you mean you're going to destroy my original evidence in order to get me digital evidence? That's, that seems like a, a problem, and it can be depending on, um, on the circumstances. Um, so what do we do about it? I don't think I'm here to tell you all the answers. I think part of the answer is in being here, right? Um, as we learn more, um, as Jake said in his talk, we learn how much we don't know. And even when we know how much we don't know, there is just a sea, an ocean out there of things that are beyond our own knowledge. So coming together and sharing like this is one way that we can start to incorporate these, in, these issues into our, our daily practice. Um, some of this has to do with patience, right? It has to do with waiting until the technology catches up to where we're at and finding the right individuals to apply their brains to these problems in order, uh, in order to solve them um, and then share it with others out there. Um, so back to that first slide. Do you remember the first slide about drive imaging and getting a, a first to last bit image of the hard drive? Up until 2012, when I read the paper that I cited in that slide, um, I used to say, you know, I imaged this hard drive and I got a bit for bit image of the entire drive and that's what I did my forensics on. And my police reports read basically that way. After 2012, I added the words user addressable areas, <laughs> right? And then if it was a case where it made sense to, I would explain what I wasn't getting um, or try to go after that data and document it in other ways. And that's kind of the approach we take, right? If we learn something new that sort of changes the paradigm in our, um, in our field, there's, there is this temptation to go, I'm going to wait, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover up, I'm going to keep doing things the way I've always done them. I'm not going to take any risks. I'm going to wait for the world to sort it out, right? And once somebody tells me that they understand it and they start teaching it, then I'll be good, right? And I'll change what I'm doing and, and it'll make more sense. Um, I'm here to tell you we're all on the edge. Right? We are all on the edge of understanding of this stuff. And it's because technology moves faster in its, uh, in its progression than any one of us can keep up with. Um, and so we are always on the edge of discovery in this world. Um, so when you find it, share it. And when you share it, make sure that it comes with some good advice about how to apply it in the work you're doing in, in the future. And that's it. My contact information is up here. Thank you.